I want to get right to the word this morning. I'm, I know time is getting away from us. Open your Bible again to Psalm 105. I know I had you just start there a little while ago, but go there again with me. Psalm 105, please. Hallelujah. If you noticed in your bulletin, in the pastoral thoughts, this is one of those ones you might want to hang on to. Just kind of tear, tear this one little side off and let it inspire you like it did me. I was going through my files and different things, preparing for service today, and I pulled that out of my file. I said, yeah, that's a keeper. I want to put that in there. The Word of God. The foundation of this church is the Word of God. How many of you realize that? I know a church will take the personality of its pastor, no matter what denomination it is, whatever personality the pastor has, if it's very controlling or not so controlling or real personable or not personable or more analytical rather than emotional, whatever the makeup of the senior pastor is usually the church will follow how many know and take on that same type of character and personality but i i I remind myself all the time and i want to publicly remind you regularly this church is not built on my gifts this church is not here because of my personality this church is built on the uncompromised, undiluted, ever eternal, unchanging word of Almighty God. Say amen, somebody. This church is built on the word. And that's why folk that don't like the word, don't want so much of the word, would rather get a little Bible verse and a poem, and that's about all they care about. They don't stay in this church. It's only the reachers that stay in this church. It's only lovers of the word that stay in this church. It's only people that want to grow. Amen? And that's who I'm sent to. And that's why I put this in your pastoral thoughts. Acknowledge its authority and bow to it. Meaning the word of God. Acknowledge its supremacy and obey it. Hallelujah. Acknowledge its sufficiency and rejoice in it. Acknowledge its integrity and testify to it. Acknowledge its precious truths and feed on it. Acknowledge its word and give heed to it. Acknowledge its truths and walk in the light of it. Acknowledge fulfillment of its prophecies and have hope through it. Acknowledge its solemn warnings and learn to fear God through it. Acknowledge its power and live by it. Amen. The word of God. Say the word of God. It is eternal. Amen. So hang on to that. If you ever thought about, which leads perfectly into where I want to go, and basically because of the clock, I'm only going to be able to introduce this today. We'll spend more time in the coming weeks on this. But we go back to the life of Joseph today, and I want to just quickly share, I know you know this, but just for those that may not, have you ever thought about how God creates? Does he wave his mighty hand and it happens? Does he stop and think about it and ponder it and his thoughts make it happen? I mean, we know God's a creator. He created each one of us. He created our destinies. He created our assignment in life, just like Joseph. But how does he create? Who wants to tell me how he creates? Come on, class. It's not a tough question. Amen. When God wants to create something, he speaks. In the very beginning of the Bible, in the book of Genesis, where we read where God wanted to create the heavens and the earth. And what did he do? He said, let there be light. He spoke into being, and those words that he spoke 
had creative power. Say amen, somebody. God spoke, said, let us make man in our image, and here comes man. Let this be, let that be. Hebrews 11, 3, in fact, if you could put that up quickly, Michael, I know I told you to go to Psalm 105 because we're going to get there. But quickly, in Hebrews 11, 3, it tells us that the worlds were framed by the what? The Word of God. So that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. Meaning the invisible word had creative power to create everything that is visible. So everything God created, he created by the words of his mouth. God only speaks what he wills. Now in the book of John, it says, you put that up please, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word, get this, was God. If you ever question the Trinity or the doctrine of the Trinity, settle it once and for all with this right here. It says the Word was with God, meaning the Son was with the Father from the beginning. But what? It goes on to say the Word was God. Jesus is God. Jesus is the Son of God, but yet he is no less divine than his Father. Say amen. So, Jesus and the Word are one. Now, if you keep reading down into verse 3, it tells us that all things were made through what? Exactly, through him which is the Word. So the Word refers to his son Jesus, but notice he calls his own son the Word. Glory to God. You want some more of Jesus? Get some more of his Word. Hallelujah. You want to be like Jesus? Spend time in his Word. Hallelujah. So it says that all things were created by Jesus, but who is what? The Word. So when God wants to make something, get it, class, he what? He speaks it. He says it. And when God has a plan for something, he speaks it forth. Now, we understand that with creation, but let's bring it down personal. Let's bring it down to Joseph, and let's bring it down to us. When God has a plan for someone, he always speaks. When he speaks, power is released for that thing to be created. I often tell. I never share all the details. It's so precious and holy of visitation, but the Lord walked into my bedroom a number of years ago. And among the things he spoke to me, he said, I've called you to be a gatekeeper in this city. That word went down on the inside of me and literally changed my heart, changed my life, changed my mind, changed things in my soul, changed things ar around me. Literally, when that word went in my spirit, I was a different man. God's plan he had from the beginning when he spoke it. Are you getting this? Now God had a plan for Joseph life, Joseph's life. God has a plan for your life. And Joseph didn't know the plan, didn't know the details, but God spoke. How did he speak? He spoke with dreams. Whether you realize it or not, dreams is one of the ways God speaks to us. And before Joseph ever endured a test, God had already spoken through the dreams of the destiny for Joseph. God had already spoken regarding the final outcome that he had planned. God didn't show 
Joseph all of the tests and all of the difficulties and all the challenges. He spoke what? The end result. Here's what I've called you to be. Here's what I've called to happen in your life. And so he saw that dream. And that dream, which was God's spoken word to him, get this, those dreams were God's spoken word to him was a prophetic test. Say this, say the prophetic test. God has a plan for every one of us just like he did Joseph. And as we just understood, God has a plan for something. Whenever he does, he does what? He speaks. So that means that God has already spoken his plan over everyone under the sound of my voice. How many got that? If God has a plan for your life and God speaks his plan from the beginning, then God has already spoken a plan over your life. He's already spoken a specific plan over my life. And when he spoke, the power was released to carry each one of us toward the destiny that he planned. Now let me review for 10 seconds. We started with the what test? The pride test. When he passed the pride test, he had to go to the pit and went through the pit test. When he got out of the pit, he had to pass the palace test. <laughs> From the palace test, he had to run to stay pure and pass the purity test. And when he passed the purity test, he got thrown in prison. So the last one we've been dealing with for many weeks has been the prison test. But now we move to Psalm 105 and look at the prophetic test because the prophetic test is finding God's word for our life. See, God has, how many realize God has called each one of us for a specific purpose? I know a lot of preachers preach on purpose, and I do too. I love it. But understand something. That purpose comes with a spoken word. That purpose comes with some kind of a promise given. You can go in my office and there's thousands of books and special gifts and treasured belongings and I have a lot of Florida State memorabilia. It's all very important to me. I have a helmet. I call it my helmet of salvation. It's a mini Florida State helmet. It's on my desk, and it's signed to Joe from Bobby Bowden. That's St. Bobby Bowden, by the way. I have another one. It's signed by Charlie Ward. He's a saint, too, by the way. Amen. I have a lot of Florida State stuff. I cherish all of them. And by the way, did you see our very own 55? I got a, got a shout out from my brother, Derek Brooks, as he went into the Hall of Fame last night. I, I'll be quick on this story, but way back when Derek came to the Bucks in his very first season, I had the privilege of having a private he was a part of a big church over there, and I won't go into the details, but that pastor was a friend of mine, invited me over, and actually went with Perry Stone. And Perry Stone did a private Bible study to the Buccaneer players at this church. And, you know, Perry's a pal of mine, and so I went with him. And at the end of the Bible study, Perry said, Joe, come on and let's pray. For, uh, for the players. I couldn't wait to get to Derek, man. I'd watched him in the Garnet and Gold win our national championship, and man, I just knew he was. And I remember praying for him, and as I laid hands on me, the Lord said, Pro Bowl, Pro Bowl, Pro Bowl. The Lord says, tell him Pro Bowl. I wish it had been Hall of Fame, but the Lord didn't tell me that. But 
but he did say Pro Bowl. He's been to more Pro Bowls than any other linebacker in his position and went into the Hall of Fame last night and gave all the glory to Jesus, gave all the glory to God. <clears throat> all right, you women, stop rolling your eyes around in your head now. I, we are the national champs, though. Hallelujah. He, he did acknowledge that. He said, yay, 2003. Oh, and he went in with Walter Jones. Walter Jones is a Florida State guy, too. Anyway, okay, okay. <clears throat> Lord, give me that. Give me, give, give me back, Lord. Give me back. Give me back. Where's my wife to slap me when I... Okay. Say the word will test us. There's no one else who can do what God has called you to do. There's no one else who can do what God has called me to do. I'm not going to do your job. You're not going to do mine. But together, if you'll do yours and I'll do mine, we can go where God is taking us. Amen. But it's up to us to find out the specific words that God has spoken over our lives. Now, I remember why I brought up all the Florida State stuff and got sidetracked. In my office, I have a lot of cherished things. I started talking about my office and then went to Derek Brooks. I'm sorry. Just couldn't help it because still the euphoria of last night. Anyway, in my office, if you go in my office, there's many treasured things, many things that, that are valuable to me as mementos. They've been gifts. I can show you different things. But there's one item that's the most important item in the whole office next to my Bible. Of course, I take that with me a lot of times. It's not in the office. But there's a little tiny picture if you ever come in my office, I'll show it to you. And my sister found this picture. And this is what I want to weave in here. Because God has spoken over all of our lives. You say, well, not me. God's never spoke to me. Well, let me talk to your mama. Because maybe God spoke something to your mother that you don't even know. Show me your grandmother. Show me someone in your life. Show me, amen, amen, because God's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He doesn't just care about us. He cares what we give birth to. He's a generational God. Some mothers and grandmothers carry words that God gave them for their children. Folks, that little, that little picture is an altar in a church up in Ohio. And you see my father, he's got a, Flat top, <laughs> black hair and a flat top. He was really young. And my mom is there, and she doesn't even look like my mom. <laughs> She's so young and had, my mom was a brown hair when she was, I didn't tell you that. I just went all over the world. Now she's, a, she's been a blonde for 50 years. She was actually, okay, okay, anyway, you know how you women are. There's this big, massive hand, my daddy's hand laying on the chest of a little tiny, I think I might have been three, not even three-year-old boy. And there's Joey. There I am. My sister found this picture and framed it, gave it to me for my birthday about 10 years ago. It's the most treasured item in all my office. Why? Because there is a moment, a snapshot my grandmother took the picture. My grandfather is in the picture. My dad is in the picture. My mom and my dad's big massive hand on my chest like this covering up my, my chest. And my grandma stood up when they dedicated me to the Lord on that altar in that church. I didn't understand it, but God was speaking a word over my life. And if I took the time, I could come down every aisle and every row and every seat and every one of us, and there was a moment. It may not have been exactly like mine. I'm sure it wasn't, but there was a moment when God spoke over your life. There was a promise. There was something that he gave you that came from his very mouth, from his very breath. My grandfather at our wedding said these two kids, me and my wife, 
because we were kids when I got married, said these kids are like bred like racehorses, and they're supposed to run for the gospel mission. And the night he died was the same night I walked the aisle of Bible college and took my degree. Within hours of me graduating from Bible college, my grandpa went home to be with the Lord. All of the family signified that the same mantle that was on my grandfather in that moment came on me. Now, I know it's not your story. I can't tell your story, but I can only tell mine. But the fact is, is God was somewhere in our life with his promise. How many hear what I'm saying? Spoken over you, delivered to you, through your family somehow. And that is the spoken word of God. And it's up to us to believe those words and, and, and claim those words and obey him. I didn't just sit on my thumbs when he said, oh, by the way, you know. He didn't say it very casually. He spoke it directly. Called you to be a gatekeeper in this city. Son, I didn't make any mistake. I caused you to be born in this city. Why, Lord? Because you're a gatekeeper in this city. I'd spent my whole life trying to leave this city, get out of this city, run from this city. But that word went in and it changed my heart. It changed my life. And I've been running trying to obey that word ever since. How many can understand what I'm saying to you? Within weeks, we begin to pastor. I mean, just right away, we begin to pastor. God had spoken over Joseph's life, but Joseph went through some tough times. It seemed as though God's word and God's plans would never come to pass, and you and I will too. We've got a true word from God. There's going to be moments and seasons of adversity, and it's going to look in the natural like, God, you made a big mistake. I must not have heard you. That must have been pizza. It's going to look like it's never going to come to pass. Say amen, somebody. And see, in those times, Joseph was tested, get this, by the words that God spoke over his life. Would he believe God's word or not? Would he let despair and hopelessness and circumstances rule, or would he let that spoken word rule? Oh, I'm going somewhere. See, the Bible describes how Joseph experienced this test in Psalm 105. Verse 17, 18, and 19. I know I read this to you last week, and I told you I was going to come back and unpack it. I'm going to unpack this for you today. And I won't get very far because I want to get you out of here. It says, he sent a man before them, even who? Joseph, who was sold for a servant, whose feet they hurt with fetters, and was laid in iron until the time that his word came. The word of the Lord tried him. My God, my God, my God. Now let me unpack this and hasten to a close. It says here, that they hurt Joseph's feet with fetters, that he was laid in irons. So we know, it, without even reading the rest of the story, verse by verse in Joseph, if all, the, if all we had was these verses, we would know that Joseph experienced some real physical suffering during his trial. But thank God it doesn't just talk about his suffering. Because that wasn't the focus. It also talks about something else that tested Joseph. And what was it? The word of the Lord. The word, this is the prophetic test. It, 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 you, will, you will prove the word of God. It will test you. Now how? I want you to notice. 
in your King James Bible, English Bible, the word word appears how many times? Come on, look at it. You going to sleep on me already? I, stick with me here. I'm about to show you something you're never going to forget. Twice. Until that, the, until that time, his word, there's once, came and the word of the Lord, what? Now, we just read that in the King James Bible. We read right over it. But let me unpack it. Because there's two different Hebrew words behind the word word. The word is given, the word word is given twice. But in the actual Hebrew, it's two completely different Hebrew words. Translated word. And they carry two completely different meanings. Does anybody, should I quit right now or does anybody want to know? Okay, okay. Okay. They're the word, you might want to write this down in your notes someplace. I didn't give it to you, but they're the Hebrew words dabar. You would spell it D-A-B-A-R, dabar. And the Hebrew word imra, I-M-R-A-H. And just check me out. You verify this with any good Hebrew dictionary. This verse actually says this in the Hebrew. It says, until the time that his Dabar came, the Imra of the Lord tried him. Did you get that? Dabar is the first word, word. Imra is the second word, word. Now listen, the first word, Dabar, is the primary word in Hebrew for word or the word of God. It appears over 1,400 times throughout the Old Testament. And it is almost every time or most every time. Sometimes it's translated law. Sometimes it's translated sayings. But it is translated most often word. Now what does it mean? I'm glad you asked. The word debar literally means a matter that is spoken. A matter that is spoken. In other words, get this, it is a specific spoken promise. Now guess what I'll interpret that he's speaking of here. What was the specific spoken promise that God gave Joseph? His dreams. And like I told you, throughout the Bible, Old Testament and New, that is one of the ways, not the only way, not the most prominent way, but that is one of the ways God speaks to people. And what I've found over the years is people that God speaks to in dreams often carries a parallel anointing or ability to help interpret dreams. Just like Joseph. Because Joseph was used to hearing from God in his dreams. How, how many can see that was a, there was a carryover in how he could interpret others' dreams and even his own? He had a prophetic gift because of the prophetic word that was spoken over his life. How many can see that? Now, what's the second word? Imar. Excuse me. Imra, not Imar. Imra. This word, Imra, appears only 37 times in the Old Testament, and it literally means the commandment or the speech or the word, and it really is a word that clearly implies and infers the totality of God's word. Literally, the word of God, the word of the Lord. It's the literal word of God. 
Now somebody said, you mean there's two words of God? Well, listen. There is the total word of Almighty God. But then there is the personal, prophetic matter spoken of that is spoke personally and individually into a life. How many are still with me? We all have the entire Word of God. You have as much access to it as I have. It's as available to me as it is to you. God is no respecter of persons. His literal word is as good for you as it is me. Amen. But there is a prophetic spoken individual promise. Let me show it to you this way. Here's where Imra is used. Look at, look at these verses quickly. And I could spend all day elaborating this in Hebrew, and I don't have all day, but I want to get it across so, so you'll learn this and never forget it. We know some of these verses in Psalm 12, 6. It says, the words of the Lord are what? Pure words, like silver tried in a furnace, purified what? Seven times. Psalm 18, verse 30, says, as for God, his way is perfect, and the word of the Lord is what? proven or tried. And then Psalm 119 verse 11 says, your word have I hid in my heart that I what? Might not sin against you. Every one of these where it's talking about the word of the Lord or the word of God, it is the Imra, the total, totality, God's complete word. How many can see that? Each one of these verses is Imra and refers to the literal word of God. So what then is our verse really saying about Joseph? It's saying this. Until the time that Joseph's prophetic word came to pass, the literal word of God tested him. Oh, now I'm finally at where I wanted to get to. All, everything I did was introduction to get to that right there. Put this up, and I'll close here. The prophetic word will test our faith. But the literal word of God tests our character. My God, my God, my God. That is the revelation I want to get to you today. Now, I'm going to come back next week. Let me help you. This is something that some of you have understood. You just didn't know how to describe it. You didn't know how to, you didn't know how to explain it. But you already had understanding of this in this regard. My mentor, the greatest mentor I had other, other than Ray, and who is my father-in-law, and my grandpa, a person that had great influence on my life was a man by the name of Kenneth E. Hagin, prophet of God. He was given a word from the Lord to go teach my people faith. God gave him a revelation some 60, 70 years ago, of what? The spoken word of God. Now, I said all that to say this because, because a lot of you had no idea what I was just going to share with you in the Hebrew, but you've already heard this explained and described. You just didn't realize it. In the book of Ephesians, when it says, taking the sword of the Spirit which is the class, Word of God. The primary word in the New Testament, Greek, how I many Hebrew, Old Testament, Greek, New Testament? The primary word in the New Testament for the Word of God is the Greek word logos. But in Ephesians, 
It doesn't use the word logos. In the word Ephesians, when it says taking the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, it's a different Greek word entirely. It's the Greek word rhema. See, I told you, you really knew this. You just didn't know you knew this. You've already learned this, but you didn't know you learned it already. Because I'm coming at it from a Hebrew perspective now, but when you bring it over in the Greek, now you begin to understand it. In fact, the Bible school that I went to and what Brother Hagin was famous around the world for is Rhema. <laughs> Bible training sign. I used to wear a ring on one of these fingers somewhere. My finger got so fat I cut the thing off a couple years ago. But nevertheless, I used to have this big golden ring here, big, big ring. And on the front of it had a sword coming down through the mountain. And it said Rhema right on it, which is the Greek word for the spoken word of God. How many know the sword of the Spirit is a spoken word of God? But that's a different word from what? Logos. Logos is the primary main word in the Greek for the Word of God. Because guess what? It is the totality of the Word of God. When you say the Logos of God, you mean the totality of the canonized Scripture, the Word of God, the Bible. But Rhema is something specific from the Logos. Rhema is a certain specific word, we could say a prophetic word, that is what? Spoken over you, or spoken to the mountain, or spoken into a person's life. And what Paul was saying in Ephesians is, when we war against the enemy, of course we have a whole book, get this, we have a whole book that's the Logos of God. But when I'm warring a warfare with the enemy, I don't throw the whole Bible at the devil. That will be absolutely ineffective. What do I do then? I use it like a sword the same way Jesus did out in the wilderness when the devil tempted Jesus. Remember what he did? He said, it is written. He took the Logos and God as he studied it and read it and gave his life to it, suddenly the Holy Ghost took a verse and let it rise up and he spoke it prophetically into his heart. Thou shalt worship only the Lord God and him only shalt thou serve. And so when the devil came at him, he didn't throw the whole Bible. What did he do? He got that prophetic rhema and he spoke it out of his mouth. You got getting it. He put the rhema in and spoke it out like a sword piercing the enemy. We don't defeat the devil with the entire Bible. We defeat him with a spoken prophetic promise that comes out of the Bible and into our heart. He spoke it and then we speak it. Amen? That's the warfare that we go through. And I said all of that to say this. Somebody said, well, then why do we need the whole Bible? Get this and get it well. This is the heavy part. You ready? The spoken prophetic rhema does not carry the ability to bring character in your life. It is the totality of the written word of God that we must feed on daily. Are you out there now? Amen. Meditate day and night. You said cud. That's exactly the picture of the word meditate. It's a word that literally means to chew it and chew it and swallow it and bring it back up and chew it and chew it and swallow it and bring it back up and just like a cow will chew its cud we allow the word of God every day 
If you'll meditate on the book of this law, what was it when Joshua said that, the book of that law? You ready for this? It was the total Bible they had, which was the first five books of the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, the law, the Torah, the law of God. So when Joshua came along and God said, meditate in the law of God, he was saying the word of God, the totality of the word of God that you've been given, meditate on a what? Day and night, night and day. So that, here's the key, so that thou mayest observe to do. See, we live in America where we figure it's just enough. Boy, that was a good sermon. I sure did. I sure was glad I heard that. Two hours later, after they get a nice meal in them, you just come by and ask them, hey, what was the message on? Uh, 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 man, it was good. I, I know it was good, man. Man, I was shouting, man. I was shouting, but, uh, can you remember any of it? Uh, uh, I didn't mention your name. Now, see, here in America, we love to hear another word. Oh, just give me another word. I'm going to go somewhere with this. See, see, we're not careful. This modern-day American church tries to live on prophetic word after word after. Oh, hunting the next meeting. Oh, I'll come over if you got a word for me. Oh, I'll give $100 if you get a word for me. Come on. We got a bunch of people abusing the debar instead of proclaiming the Imra. There, I just said it, hallelujah. I just said it. See, if we're not careful, we'll abuse the rhema and neglect the logos. Did you get it now? And see, the, 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 the bar, the rhema, the prophetic word is gonna, is gonna build our faith. It's gonna challenge our faith. We're gonna be able to release our faith. You know how many people I've seen that on Sunday can release their faith and on Monday lives like the devil with two cats? Well, you're not listening to me. I got kinfolk. I won't talk about you. I'll talk about me. I got kinfolk. I mean, can raise the dead on Sunday and raise hell on Monday through Friday. Oh, did I just say it? Yeah, I did. They elevate their ability to have faith. Oh, I trust God. I'm going to believe God. I'm just going to believe God. And then Monday, chase every skirt at work. Oh, I said it there in Sunday. I said it. No, folks. The prophetic word is there. It's a part. No doubt about it. The rhema, we need it. Because it'll challenge. It's a test of our faith. But folks, we cannot throw out the totality of the Word of God because it is the Word of God that will prove our character. Stand up on your feet. My God, my God. I hope you never forget what I just showed you right there. Hallelujah. Don't leave here in a two hours say, well, that was a good message. I, I just don't remember any of it. See, why did Joshua, that was the thought. I'll close with that. Why did Joshua say that thou mayest observe to what? Do it. See, in America, we got the hearing part down. Every new Christian television network with every new Christian voice on there, all the churches, you know what the truth is? Is America is as godless as it's ever been. I'm telling you, America is as godless right now. Amen. It's on a deep, steep incline down. But by revival, there'll be no survival for this nation. When the righteous has lost its savor, when the salt has lost its savor, then we are no longer a preserving element in this earth. And it is scarily closer and closer and closer every day. They tell me they closed about 500 churches a week in America today. You know what? In the Time Magazine, I got it to show you, Rob. I may refer to it here. Whole two-page spread in Time Magazine about the new wave in America the atheist church 
they are specifically, strategically planting. They don't call it a church. They'll call it something slick, like a gathering of human endeavor or a gathering of human interests. And it's a bunch of atheists, and they come and have a gathering like church. They have songs, and a guy will speak. In fact, one of them is a former Pentecostal pastor that is now a proclaimed atheist. Folks, it, listen, the America you were born in, the America you and I grew up in, baby, ain't here no more. It's long gone, and it ain't ever coming back, so you just better realize we are living closer and closer to a post-Christian era, era in America. Now, why? Because our church is anemic? How can a man preach in a pulpit for years, be a pro- Pentecostal ordained minister and become an atheist and leave the pulpit and and they don't want to just go to hell themselves they want to take as many people to hell with them as they can why because folks it's not enough to hear the word that Pentecostal preacher probably lived on rhema words while he neglected the word of God Are you getting that? It's the Word of God that's consumed that will build our character. Let's lift our hands toward heaven. Father, I thank you. Lord, I know this is a strong word. I know this is not an easy word. I know this this isn't a run and shout and and dance in the street word. But Lord, we need to hear it. And Lord, I just thank you for your presence that manifested in this service today. And Lord, we glorify you. Above all else, we glorify you. And I thank you that your word is manna from heaven. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Lord, bless everyone under the sound of my voice. And I release the saints this day for your honor and your privilege and your pleasure. Lord, let us walk in our assignment and fulfill the dream you have on our life. In the mighty name of Jehovah, and everyone said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. I'll see you Wednesday night. Amen. God bless you.